start this morning. Romans 12, 9 through 11. Look at that, I'm on the wrong page already. Fix that. There we are. Romans 12, 9 through 11. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Father God, I I ask that today's message, today's words that come out of my mouth would be of you, Lord. God, I I know what we're coming up to today, and and Lord, I just ask that that you would give extra grace and extra extra wisdom as we continue through, through the vision call. Lord, I thank you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I was putting this morning's sermon together, I know what God wanted me to get out. I know what the message was that God really wanted me to to share today. The problem is I wasn't 100% sure exactly how to start. Okay, that's that's usually the, the problem. You know what God wants you to say, and then sometimes you run into a, how do I start today? So as a church... We've seen a lot of change since May 2020. I put that meme up last week. Marty, don't go back to 2020 with a DeLorean. Some of the things that we've experienced since March of 2020. We were closed down because of a pandemic. Right after we were closed down, Brian Link and myself, we struggled and we scrambled to find a way that we could continue to stay connected as a church. Using a cell phone on a tripod, we found a way to to get Pastor Dave's word out and, and worship out each week as well to our members and, and to those who would find us on Facebook or YouTube. Then things continue to move forward. And about a year ago, Mary Anthony came to me and she contacted me via email and she sent me a prophetic word. And that prophetic word is something that we're actually walking out today. That prophetic word was very prophetic as to what we're what we're experiencing, and excuse me, what I'm experiencing and what I'm doing right now. There was, there was a lot of things that were happening behind the scenes and God was orchestrating and putting these pieces together. Even the two words that were shared this morning, what would you guys think of those two words this morning? Those were excellent words for our church, right? How about Ryan on the show far? <clears throat> he doesn't know it, but he's almost part of the worship team. So... <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, not quite. Well, we'll get you there. As we progressed into warmer weather last year, I had God slam three literal doors in my face. After the third slam, I quickly repented and I said, God, it's, it's your will. God, it's, it's your desires in my life that I'm going to walk out. And no matter where it is, no matter what it is, I'm, I'm here for you. A couple weeks after that, Pastor Dave came to me, and Pastor Dave and I started to talk, and we started to have some more in-depth weekly chats, not just our in-depth monthly chats. They become more of a weekly chat. And we started to talk more about the future of Believer's Chapel, what was going on, what was taking place in Believer's Chapel, Canastota, how we were going to move forward, what some of the progression was going to be. And then at one point, towards the end of the summer, he told me, Mary and I are looking for a house in Pennsylvania. You need to be ready to take over this church. We had those kinds of chats. We had those kinds of talks. Then as we progressed into the fall months, we let leadership in on what was going on, what was taking place. Since I've stepped into this pulpit last fall, knowing what was going to be taking place, I've been preaching and teaching you guys the vision that God has put on me, the vision that God has put in my heart for a church and the direction we're going to head. It's it's nothing new. It's, It's more of a continuation. But through all of that, I'm still working out the truths in my own life of that vision. Because how many of you know that vision comes in steps? It's not something that comes... You don't get 100%. If you did, you know what would happen to your head? It would explode, and it would make a big mess. Yeah, 
we'll clean it. After yesterday's cleanup day, I'm not calling anybody in to clean anything up except Pam on a weekly basis. <laughs> how many of you love change? Show of hands. Yeah, me too. You want to know how I love change? I love it in a big sack. Um, I love it in a big bag. So any of you who want to give me a bag of change, I'll take it. Dimes are my favorite because dimes are worth the most for their size. Okay, they're the most valuable. All right, so Romans 12.10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. A change in visionary usually brings a major change. It usually brings something that there has to be a rebirthing, a renewing. Not necessarily a change of mission or a change of vision, but just like a refreshing of the vision at least, at minimum. Under Pastor Doug, this church was founded and the first vision was laid out. The first vision was defined. Under Pastor Dave, we continued in that same pathway. A slightly different vision, but still the mission of God. God's given me a similar vision, but taking it to a renewed level, refreshed level. Actually, today as I'm mentioning both those leaders that went before me, I want to honor them. We've been kicking this around a little bit in huddle meetings back and forth, but we've never really moved. We've never really done anything. Today, I'm, I'm going to make it public because I, I, I have to give honor to these two men who went before me, these two men who built and continued this foundation that we stand on today, these two men who poured into us for all of these years. We've been kicking around some ideas from this point forward, the library is going to be known as the Pastor Doug Bruchel Library. His years of wisdom. Man, that I could go sit now. Uh, his years of wisdom and study have planted a foundation here that we can all grow upon. He and his family, they sacrificed, they purchased out of their pocket. They truly, truly laid down their lives for this, for this house of God, for this church. The prayer and counseling room, or as I refer to it as the PAC room, yes, that's the office room next to my office. The prayer and counseling room. That's going to be known as the Pastor Dave Allen PAC room. The years of prayers that Dave has put forth to the Lord have blessed this house. He's a man who's seeking God's will and provision for this church. So I want to honor the two of them. Uh, with those two rooms being named after them. <laughs> Thank you. They deserve honor for what they've poured out. Now you're probably thinking, hey, Pastor Jake, you need something. I haven't done anything yet. There was too much laughing. <laughs> I was thinking if you put a new septic tank in, I'm not your guy. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so now for us today, as we honor the past, we're moving forward into a new future, into something different, into something new. And something that, that I've been working through these past few months is my college semester. Please pray for me. I finished my last lecture Friday. Thank you, Jesus. I still have... Of the large book I have to read, I still have a large portion to read. Um, a week from Monday, my seven-page paper is due. Um, I may just turn in this sermon after I'm done and say, here, is this good enough? But <clears throat> the interesting thing about this semester, my class I've been taking is vision leadership. And vision leadership is kind of what I've been passing out to you guys, the vision of where we're going, what's happening. Now, here's the interesting thing. Every time I would have a meeting... Every time I would have a, a, a sermon or something that I'm trying to pass along, the following week's lectures were exactly what I just did the week before. I'm going to give myself a 98 on those <laughs> because a 100 will be prideful. <laughs> and I probably would have misspelled a word, so I would have ended up with a 98. Last week was a defining sermon. How many of you were here last week? There's a whole bunch of you here last week. Last week was defining. Last week, I preached a vision. And it was a pleasure to see 
each of you stand up, confess, and then say that you are on board to be a disciple maker in God's disciple factory. Love that. Matthew 16, 17 through 19. Matthew 16, 17 through 19. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. See, right here we see something that, that Jesus did that was something special. It was something different, something that happened. We, we see an individual who has his name changed. We see Simon Barjona now being called Peter. Now, if you're wondering that Barjona was not a last name, Barjona means son of. So he was son of Jonah or son of John. So Simon, son of John, now we know who his dad was. It was John. We can blame John for him. That was a joke. You're supposed to laugh at those. Thank you. Peter means rock. Totally change in, in names as to who he was. As you do a study of Scripture, we see where the Lord changes names or people change names throughout Scripture. A couple of examples that we have is, is Adam changing the name of his mate from the woman to Eve. Changed her name. And then another one that we have would be Naomi. She changed her own name to Mara. Not her own Naomi, a different Naomi. So just want to make sure there's no confusion. You didn't change your name, Mara. Okay, so <clears throat> it is always special if God or Jesus changes your name. And then when that happens, it's because there's a spiritual reason. There's something that God has planned. Big example would be Abraham and Sarai being changed to, or Abram and Sarai being changed to Abraham and Sarah. The significance of their names being changed. The name of Jacob being changed from Jacob to Israel. And what was a big deal there? Now in Old Testament times, when you look at a name, a name had meaning. A name was definitive. A name spoke to who that person was, what they did, what they were going to do. It spoke to their life. A name gives definition. Now, I think most of you here know where I'm going with this, but one of the things that's been on my heart has been our church's name. Believer's Chapel, Canastota. Love the name. It's a great name. Study it out sometime. Do a study of what a believer is. Do a study of the word chapel. Come to an understanding of what that means. There's a few problems with the name as we move forward, though. We're moving into a now season, into a new season, into something different. I'm no way knocking the original name, Believer's Chapel, Canastota, but we should make some changes. Canastota is an example. What city is our building in? Canastota. But I want you to look at a map. When you go home, look at a map. Pull up Google Maps, Google Earth. And then take a look at where the church is actually located. If you look at Route 5 and you do a calculation of miles, guess what? We're pretty much smack dab in the middle between Chittenango and Canastota. We have two villages that we're responsible for, church. Two villages, not just one. One of those communities holds the Boxing Hall of Fame, world-renowned also has a major interstate that flows through it in the New York State Thruway. You get on the Canastota, you get on that Thruway, you can go anywhere east or west in this state very quickly. If you look in the other direction, you have the birthplace of Frank E. Baum. What was he famous for? Wizard of Oz, Wizard of Oz another world-known location. Chittenango is also the gateway to Syracuse, isn't it? Head down Route 5, boom, you're there. Geographically, New York State, Pratt's Hollow, geographical center of New York State. If you take all the furthest points, you run lines, you end up a few hundred yards out of my parents' backyard where I grew up. I could probably take you in through the farmer's field up into the woods and say, it's over there somewhere. 
and show you kind of where it is. You could stand in that spot. It's not marked because the farmer doesn't want it marked, but it's not marked. I'd like us to kind of stop and drop the Canastota name completely. Everybody okay with that? All right, good. Some would say that our church is located in the middle of nowhere, but based on the information I just gave you, where are we located? We're located in the middle of everywhere, right? We're located right smack dab in the middle of the state. Which brings me to another question. We're, before I get to the question, just a quick statement. We're responsible for a region. So now my question, how big is a region? How big is a region? Pretty big. About that big. Three arm lengths and two hands. What are we measuring, horses? <clears throat> D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody, when he was on his deathbed, he told his sons that if God is on your side, make your plans big. I'm a go big kind of guy. I don't like settling for anything. Okay, my, my wife will tell you that. I'm, when I sit down, I dream about stuff. I'm giving her, man, let's do this, let's do that. And it's all huge, ginormous stuff. There's only one problem with that. When you have one, vi one visionary who's coming up with the vision and they're the one who's responsible for doing all the work, does the vision become fulfilled? No. It, it never happens. There, it takes more than just one person, and that's this vision for this church as well. It takes more than just one. It's going to take a team effort. It's going to take a team running a food pantry. It takes a team here on, on a Saturday or yeah, Saturday morning cleaning. It takes a team here on a Sunday morning to put a service on. And a Saturday afternoon, or excuse me, now I'm getting ahead of myself. Now I'm already up to four or five services a weekend. But it takes a team to put all that together. Don't worry, worship team. We will get more. <laughs> they all say hallelujah as they're tired. Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8. But well, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. See, Jesus tells his followers that they're to be a witness. But that word witness there doesn't actually mean like Perry Mason, I'm in court and I'm a witness now getting called up. I guess swear on the Bible and all. It has nothing to do with that. It's not... That isn't the original word. The original word in Greek is, is martis. That word martis actually translates into our modern word martyr today. Puts that in a little bit of a different perspective for you when you think about, oh, I'm just a witness. I just got to tell somebody something. That's it. But when you start to put that into context, that, that Jesus is calling you to be a martyr, it's so much deeper. It's so much more passionate that you're laying down your life for a cause. You're laying down your life for a purpose and for a reason. It's not your own. It's for Christ. Back to my notes. Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the home city. How many cities do we have we're responsible for, church? Two. Two. <clears throat> and the surrounding region. Samaria. Or excuse me, let's bump back up to Judea in that verse. Judea is their region. Judea would be the bottom part of the nation Israel. The bottom half would be Judea. They were responsible for that as well. And then Jesus tells them to go a step further, and the step further he tells them to go to is, is Samaria. Samaria are those people who are different than you. How many people talk to people who are different than you? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of us, which is good. We should be talking to different people because you know what? You do that, you get a different perspective. How many of you talk to an atheist from time to time just for fun? Yeah, me too. Love that. Lock them in your car. <laughs> Take them for a drive. Bring them to youth, and in a few weeks, they'll be saved. That's what I did. The end of the earth. The ends of the earth is the last place that Jesus tells them to take the gospel. The ends of the earth was... Where is that? Messina. Where else? It. Hey, that's not even funny. <laughs> <clears throat> 
my, off topic now, my mom's listening, but anyway, she posted on Facebook yesterday pictures of the snow outside and how she wasn't going to get to enjoy her morning coffee. So, of course, me being the person I am, and I love snow and I love winter, I posted a little heart emoji and posted a comment that says, I love it, but unfortunately, we're not going to get any more here in the Oneida area. No, I curse all of you. <laughs> I jest. Um, <clears throat> So then I have an uncle who posted, and he says, hey, maybe you could go to Antarctica and preach there. And I said, yeah, that would be great, but there's not many souls there to be one. And then he says, practice on the penguins. So, yeah, even my family has my back. <laughs> so in these two communities that we're responsible for, what do you think the number one issue and number one problem is that I see? I'll just tell you it's easier. Pride. Pride. When, when you look at it, the, the pride that people have, it's, it's, it's okay to have pride, but you have to have pride in the right things. People's pride is, is pointing to an inward self. It's not pointing to an outward Jesus. They're, they're more concerned about them than they are anybody else. And they're, they're not even concerned about the relationship with God. They're concerned about gimme, gimme, gimme. Put in my notes here, they, they love a life of either trying to sustain what they have or they're trying to gain more for their own selfish ambitions. Would that be a pretty good sum up of people? Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will a profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for a soul? See, here's Jesus is talking to his disciples. These are the ones that he's continually teaching. He's continually working with. He's encouraging. He's uplifting. He's pointing them in the way that they need to go. He's pointing them to the kingdom of God and, and through him is the door and is the entrance. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come with the angels in the glory of his Father, and when will and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Anybody a little bit nervous of this verse? Should be. We all should be. There's a repayment for us as well. There's a wage for our sin. Jesus also said that he was the door in John 10, 7. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. The only way to the Father is through Jesus. You have to enter into the kingdom of God through him. There are no multiple spokes into heaven. John 14, 4 and 6. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, everything is so much Jesus-centered. It's all about him. There's no other way into heaven, once again, except through Jesus. He is the way. Let's talk about vision for a second. What is vision. Merriam-Webster has a very long definition. I'm just going to hit some high points. Something seen in a dream. A thought, concept, or object formed by the imagination. Cross out imagination, right? Holy Spirit. Mode of seeing or conceiving. Unusual discernment or foresight. The act or power of seeing. Or something seen. A visionary sees the vision out ahead further than most. Does vision take faith? It does. If you're going to walk a vision out, you need to have faith that what you're seeing out ahead can be accomplished, that what you're seeing out ahead can be walked out. So you need to have that. Now, what happens without vision? Proverbs 29 18. 
where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. See, without vision, we just wander aimlessly. We, we have no goal. We have nothing that we're shooting for. We're just a group of people that get together on a Sunday. Going someplace without a map. Going someplace without a map or no GPS. I don't know what a map is. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm old enough. I know what a map is. I watched Dora. So... <clears throat> I'm not going to sing it for you, but I would my kids later. Vision often comes in stages, like I said earlier. Vision is a track. Vision gives us something to shoot for. It gives us a goal, a mission. If we shoot for the stars, excuse me, if we shoot for the moon, what happens? We We end up in the stars, which is still awesome. A vision used for anything else other than for the God and for his purposes is a perversion of that vision. So this past week in college, we had our very last discussion question. They ask a very deep question. This one was two sentences, basically says, look at, in your first book you read, or second book, I can't remember which, look at the 12 stages of a church, and look at the bell curve, read the definitions of each, and then tell us where your church is right now. Most students are not in the midst of doing what I'm doing when they're taking this class. Most students will be two, three years out of this class before they're doing the very thing that we're learning about. So I gave kind of an honest perspective. I told them exactly where we've been, and I told them exactly where we are right now on that bell curve. I talked about our rebirthing and our renewing of a new vision, a renewing of the church and how we were moving forward. And the coolest part, even though I just laid it all out there, I wasn't expecting anybody to respond. I ended up with a few people who responded, and every single one of them were impressed at the vision. Every one of them was impressed at where we've been and where we're going. And so if you log into my, here's my password and stuff. No, I'm just kidding. They were most impressed with the hearts of the people in this church because I talked about some of you and I talked about how people are stepping up. People are doing things that they haven't done before. People are excited about a vision that they don't even have fully defined in front of them. But in the spirit, they can sense something new is taking place. So with that, if you haven't figured it out by now, Part of the vision is a new name for the church. The new name is not new. It's an old name. It's a rebirthing of a name. I'll say it again. Yes, we're changing the name of the church. As I give you the new name this morning, if you hate it, hear me out before you say that's stupid. All right, if you really dislike it, come see me on Monday or Tuesday afternoon here and visit with me, and we can discuss it a little bit further. The new name actually appears 298 times in the ESV and has several different meanings. We did have an elder vote and a leader vote two weeks ago about, and I want to say it passed 100%. Perfect, okay? There was no, nobody had any qualms or problems. I did have a few people come and talk to me about some issues, and we discussed them, and they're okay now. I also want to say before I give you the new name, (laughs) I know, suspense is my thing. Yeah, because I keep stuff secret if I have to. Every sermon that I've done since October, I've mentioned that name with the exception of one sermon. I found a way to squeeze it in. Nate was actually listening to all of them, trying to figure out what the new name was. Um, some Shunammite woman church? Is it, was that one of them? No, that was your wife's? Okay. So I immediately changed from the Shunammite woman to something else. Um, <laughs> Okay, so in all seriousness, 
uh, the new name uh, is the Way Ministries. And as we're thinking about that, letting that process, let's go to Acts 24, 14 through 15. If you have your paper Bible, Acts 24, 14 through 15. The Way Ministries. So here's what Paul has to say. But this I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Now, if you have your paper Bible with you and you've got a pen or crayon, magic marker, highlighter, feel free to underline the way. The truth is that there's only one way to eternal security. With the Father in heaven, that's with Jesus. In the, books, in the book of Acts, what was the early church called? The way. The people of the way. Truth is that there's only one way to that eternal security. The way means that Jesus is the only way, and he demands exclusive loyalty. Here's one of the quotes that I stole from one of the author of a book that I read recently. In the early church to be part of the way meant you made the proclamation to be faith-based and live a self-sacrificial lifestyle that was part of that community. See, we've come to a point in our society today how many people do you know that actually know Christ in comparison to 40 years ago? I'm 43 years old. I'm ashamed. Individuals my age, don't laugh, I'm not that old. <laughs> I'm ashamed because I look at our society today. Individuals under the age of 40, where are they? Where are they? Chasing career, chasing their own selfish ambitions. Somewhere in there we've lost our way. We've lost the vision that God had for us. Doing youth ministry for all these years, something that turns my stomach and just makes me sick. Individuals under the age of 20. You sit down, you want to have a conversation, you bring up David and Goliath. They don't know the story. You sit down with somebody under the age of 20. You start to talk to them about Noah and the ark, the flood. Not a clue. You talk about Jonah and the great fish. Not a clue. It's lost to these individuals under the age of 20. Mm -hmm. So people today... You talk to somebody who's in that 20s age group, do they have an opinion on Christianity? Oh, yeah, they have an opinion. But have they ever read the Bible? Have they ever studied anything? Do they know anything about Scripture whatsoever? No, but they formed an opinion. Matthew seven thirteen through 14. Entered by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. It says the way there twice. Go ahead and underline those. That's the way they stand out to you when you look at it. See, there's, there's two ways in life. You've got the, the right way, and then you also have the, the wrong way. The wrong way is going to lead you to destruction, whereas the right way is going to lead you to life. Paul would actually say in one of his letters, follow me as I follow Christ. We talked about follow me last week. We, we talked about that. We talked about the example of that. And as Dave said with, with the map, that you need to have somebody who's, who's leading the way, somebody who has the map, somebody who knows the direction on where to go. And that direction, Paul understood, was through Christ. And that was the purpose of, of him saying what he said. Now, a study out of Scripture for the way ministries. A few things that, that stand out to me. 
One, the way is not stationary. Think about that for a second. The way is not stationary. The way means you're moving. <clears throat> because if you're stationary, you're not going anywhere. You're, there's nothing on the way. You're not doing anything. The way is directional. We're seeking Jesus, not only going ourselves, but we're also bringing others with us. And we're also a different breed of people. How many of you would agree you're different, strange, odd, peculiar people, whatever your version of Scripture uses in your own head? A few weeks back, actually a couple months ago now, I was leaving here on a Wednesday night. Um, a deer decided to run out in front of me like they do from time to time, and I hit a deer. My vehicle wasn't totaled, but I had some damage done. And I went to a local body shop that my insurance company works with directly. I said, I'll give them a chance. So I get there. I know you're thinking Jake and his total cars. but So anyway, I go there, and I, I'm talking to the woman who's doing the appraisal for me. And I'm cracking jokes. We're just having a good time. And as we get talking, I told her, I said, by the way, on my auto policy, I pay extra so I can get a minivan for a rental vehicle. I need a minivan. I can't be without a minivan. I need a minivan. Give me a minivan, please. I need a minivan. And you should have bought a minivan, Ryan. So <laughs> way cooler than a truck. <laughs> okay, now back to my story. <laughs> so I'm talking to this woman about why I need a minivan. And she says, well, I, why do you need a minivan? Why are you so desperate for a minivan? I said, well, I pay extra because I, I got four kids at home. And she says, wow, four kids? Must be you and your girlfriend. Or well, I said, no, I'm married. I have a wife. Um, we have four kids together. And it, it blew her mind. She's like, wait a minute. You're married to the same woman. you got four kids. Must be you had a set of twins or a couple sets of twins or triplets and a single. And she's trying to work this all out. And I said, no, 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 really, on purpose, we had four children. And then I was telling her about the miscarriage that we just had. And as I got telling her about the miscarriage, she was like, you're here and you're this pleasant and you just had a miscarriage? How, how can you be like this? And I said, ah, ha, ha. <laughs> <clears throat> open door I started sharing with her about what the Lord was doing in my life and could be doing in hers and what he's doing here at the church and then she says well I've heard of the the other chapel she says but I, I've never been there I said well you need to go there I invited her here too but she lives on the other side of Liverpool realistically though I invited her. So being part of the way is different. Being a follower of Jesus, don't we do strange things, peculiar, peculiar things? Sorry, English escapes me. How about forgiveness, helps, love, joy, peace, etc.? They're all signs of being a Christian, but are they lost on the world? Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> Pass on the way to or go by the way of. When you look at scripture, those phrases show up quite a, quite a bit, actually. As you're journeying through life, as you're traveling through life, are you going to pass by the way of things? Yeah, you're going to pass by the way of perhaps old sin, temptation. You're going to pass by the way of uh, opportunities that might not be the opportunity that the Lord actually has for you. Genesis forty-five twenty-four. Sorry, Mary, I skipped one. Then he sent his brothers away, and they departed. He said to them, do not quarrel on the way. See, this do not quarrel along the way, it speaks to the way that we're supposed to live our life. It speaks to the way that we're supposed to be set apart, we're supposed to be different. And then Revelation 3.20, God meets us on the way. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. See, it's very important that as we're going through life, we find the way that we discover him in our life. It's the Lord who ultimately guides the way, but 
don't we have a part in that guiding? Don't we have a part in pointing people in the right direction? Yeah. Exodus 13, 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them along the way. There it is again. Go ahead and underline it. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. See, the reason I'm telling you guys to underline that is because it shows up. It pops out a few 288, 298 times. My electronic version, I have it highlighted all the way through. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. That's Psalm 119, 105. The way speaks to you. You're on a path. You're on a journey. You're on a highway. You're on an interstate. Proverbs 6.23 For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. Another underlining opportunity. And as we already read earlier, Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, the life. He is the ultimate way. I know what you're thinking. After today, you're going to be like, wow, that the way is stuck in my head. <clears throat> be thankful you're not my wife. She's been hearing me talk about this for months. It's, it's actually been years that I've had this on my heart. If you look at Psalm chapter 1, God bless you. If you look at Psalm chapter 1, the way appears four times. It's the way of sinners and it's the way of righteous. It tells you the way that we're supposed to live and the verse is the way we're not. Then there's the way of wisdom, the way of foolishness. John the Baptist prepares the way. And then there's the way of love. I could keep going on and on through Scripture, but I won't. I think you pretty much get the point. Our jobs are to point the way to God. We are a people that can point a society back in the direction they're supposed to go. We are called to bring people into maturity. Discipleship is the process of bringing people into maturity. And discipleship is a journey. It's a traveling along a path. Where we ended last week, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Not part, all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. See, church, we're on a journey. We're on a journey of life. We don't have plans to return back. The only thing we care about is where we're heading. Our destination is Jesus in heaven. That's our purpose. We don't go back. However, the story that we have can be the story that helps somebody else along the way. It can be the story that points somebody else's life into the right direction. So we're going to close now. Not yet. Sorry. I have a time for question and answer at the end. Let's pop up the new logo if we could, Mary. It's been a busy year for me, hasn't it? May 2nd. I'm tired. I'm going to take a break for six months. I'm kidding. I've spent a ton of time in prayer. I've spent a ton of time seeking God and his will in this. The name and the logo are not new to me. I've, I've had both of these for, for over a decade. Okay, I've had both of these on my heart for over a decade. I thought it was fitting that, that Brian, he came to me and was, he kept telling me about this dream. And then recently the dream, he started to have it again. I thought it was fitting. The word Mary had was fitting this morning as well. I want to talk about some of the logo and some of the symbolism in the logo because, yes, I'm that kind of guy. It's still not perfected yet. It's probably going to be changing a little bit. But here's some of the logo, the cross. Do I need to explain the cross to anybody? 
Perfect. Okay, good. Skip that one. <clears throat> the Y at the end. It's kind of a meandering cursive Y. It's like a path that's that we're on, but without Christ, does our path have a mission and a purpose and a direction, or is it just meandering? It's meandering. But coming out of that, as soon as that person finds Christ, doesn't their life now have a direction? And it's pointing upwards, not downwards. One of the logos that the artist did for me actually had the logo pointing down, the arrow pointing down. I wrote back and said, I'm a pastor of a church. I want to send people to heaven, not to hell. I may tell you to go to hell, but I don't really mean it. The compass. The compass at the end, at first I thought it was a little bit of overkill. I was kind of on the fence until I had my first small leaders meeting and we discussed it. And somebody brought up the, the, there was a word spoken over this church that people are going to be coming here from the north, the south, the west, and the east. They're going to be traveling distance to get here. And I said, compass is cool, it's got to stay. The word ministries, it's plural, not singular. It doesn't just mean here. Some of the vision is outside of here, bigger than the Canastota, Chittenango area and region. Workers are few, but I know that there's a harvest coming. There's a harvest coming if we keep pushing forward, we keep doing the things that we need to do. We are not the way, but we know the way. And who is the way? Jesus. Oh, Sunday school answer, Jesus, I love it. <clears throat> Jesus is the only true way. Now, as we walk out this journey of this name change and everything else, there probably will be some other changes coming as well but realize that we are all together in this. We're all connected people on the journey. Connected people on the journey. Now, to be honest, my seven-page paper is still due. I'm thinking about just turning the sermon in. It's more than seven pages, though. It is going to be on my vision for this church. That's ultimately what I'm going to write because I've been living it. Okay, I know some of you today may be in shock and awe, and I know some of you probably have some questions. I know Dave does. No? Okay. Oh, we'll, statement? Okay. Before we get into questions, I, I want to pray, and then we'll, I'll answer any questions. We'll shut the camera off. I'll answer any questions anybody has. If you want to skip the questions and everything else, there's a cake in the back. Um, I got a cake that was donated to us. It's been sitting around for three or four weeks. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the woman baked it yesterday and brought it to me. I, ca I called her, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday. I got talking to her, and she says, don't worry about the cake. Send me the logo. I, I got you taken care of. I said, okay, I'll how much do I owe you? She said, Nothing. She says, I'm just I'm donating this cake to the church. I, I love you, Jake, and I love the church there. So she says, I'm donating the cake. So thank you, Diana. It's probably, it's probably vanilla. What's that? I just want all the frosting. All right, let's pray. Father God, I, I thank you for this morning, Lord. I thank you for the stress to be over that I've been experiencing, first off, the anxiety that I've been under, Lord, holding this under my cap for a while. Lord, I, I, I feel like I did when I, <laughs> when I met, met Jamie and I asked her parents to marry me and then I finally had the big build-up to ask her. Lord, I know that a name is important. I know that a name points... Uh, to the type of people that you've, that you've called the, this person to be or called the church to be. So, Lord, I ask now that as, as we continue to, to walk this out as a church, as we continue to 
chase after you along the way, Lord, that, that you'll continue to meet us, that you'll continue to guide us. Lord, I'm, I'm thankful for you just being the God that you are over us. Protect us, keep us in your will, keep us in your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry.